Okay, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining me for this month's Dean's Research Seminar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land I'm on today, the Boon people, as well as the traditional owners of the land that you're situated on, and acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been the custodians of these lands and the waterways of Australia for thousands of years, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. In today's seminar, we have Professor Paul Taylor, who will present um, his seminar on protecting Australia's borders from incursion of exotic plant pathogens, uh, an area that sounds to me particularly fascinating. Paul did his BSc in microbiology at La Trobe University, followed by a Master's of Science in Plant Pathology from the University of Sydney, and after that, a PhD in Plant Biotechnology from the University of Queensland. Paul then worked as a research officer in plant pathology with the Bureau of Sugar Experiment Stations, working on sugarcane crop improvement, and then on a research project for the CRC in tropical plant pathology. He joined the University of Melbourne in 1995 as a research fellow, and he worked his way up to become the Professor of Plant Pathology in 2013. Paul served in a number of leadership roles um, while he's been at the university, including on the School of Agriculture and Foods Teaching and Learning Committee, the Faculty Honours Course Committee, and University Committees for International Engagement. Indeed, he served as the Associate Dean International for the School of Land and Environment, and he's currently the Faculty's International Director for Indonesia. I had the great pleasure of traveling to Indonesia with Paul a year or so ago, and um, meeting a number of the colleagues that he has established there. Indeed, Paul has developed strong collaborative partnerships with a number of educational institutes, including Hong Kong University, the Forest Research Institute of Malaysia, Nanjing Agricultural University, the China Agricultural University, Case de Sart University in Thailand, and the Institute Polytechnique de Toulouse in France. He's also established strong collaborative industry partners, including with the pyrethrum industry and the Australian tobacco industry, and with our colleagues at AgroBio in Bundura. He's a member of a number of national and international committees on agricultural education and plant pathology. Over the years, Paul has successfully completed 12 master's students and 40 PhD students, 27 of which he was the principal supervisor for. He's co-supervised students at both Thai and Malaysian universities, and he currently supervises four PhD students. He's published nearly 150 papers in peer-reviewed journals, 21 book chapters, and has an H-index rating of 48. Paul recently retired from the university, but I'm delighted to report that as an honorary professor, he will continue to do some teaching, some research, and some student supervision. Plant pathology is an incredibly important area, and we need to recruit into this area um, to succession plan. But Paul is right now still very much with us and has agreed to give this lecture. So please welcome Paul Taylor. Paul, over to you. Oops. Um, thank you very much, John, for that introduction. Um, it's quite nice to hear those things. Just one little correction. I have had active collaborations with the Australian Processing Tomato Industry, not the tobacco industry, as well as by Reedsburn. Oh, sorry about that one, Paul. Okay, noted. That's all right. Um, I'll just share my screen. There we go. We all up and running. Okay, so my presentation today is around protecting Australia's borders <coughs> from incursion of exotic plant pathogens. Um, and looking at this, what is, uh, I'll just click on the next slide. Okay, so protecting Australia's borders from these exotic pests and diseases is known as plant biosecurity. And it's an important uh, area of government regulation that is responsible right through down to the, to the farm gate, to the industries uh, where we need to be alert and um, be able to capture any new diseases or pathogens that might come into the country. Most obvious example of plant biosecurity, I think, is at the airport. While passing through um, the airport, coming back into the country through international airports, and even in our local state airports, there are important uh, surveillance and regulations that involve the movement of plant material. 
There's also the inspections of freight, and container ships, and um, inspection of, a, of commercial produce that's imported. That is very important. I'll present today um, a bit about protecting Australia's borders, but also I want to raise an important issue is that we need to be careful and aware of what we export, uh, that we export clean produce. And I'll give some examples of some of this as I go into this presentation. Um, Australia has a very uh, dependent on, on agricultural produce and the plant industries, but this uh, border security or plant biosecurity is, is also very important for protecting our Australia's uh, native flora and, and forest. Uh, there's some very important pathogens that we do, don't want to get established in, in our, our forests as well. So it's as much about our commodities as agricultural projects as it is about our um, native flora. So in, two seven, in 2017, uh, the National Farmers Federation announced a, a vision uh, for Australian agriculture to exceed a farm gate value of 100 million by 2030. Now, it's quite ambitious. The current forecast growth trajectory is 83.4 billion by 2030, but uh, a, a report produced by Asel Allen Consulting uh, has come up with a whole list of drivers for growth production and risks. And inadequate biosecurity was listed as a major risk to the future growth of Australia's agriculture and reaching this target. So it just puts some perspective on how important this, this area of work is. I want to uh, first start with just looking at a couple of exotic pathogens, which are regarded as um, important plant biosecurity risks. And I'll just elaborate some of these, uh, more so just to show the diversity of plant pathogens, but also from an educational point of view that um, being aware of these um, selected group of pathogens um, is important to preventing them being, uh, getting established and spread. Uh, the first one is this plump box virus known as Sharka, and it's a, obviously a virus, body virus, but it's one of the most economically important diseases of stone fruit worldwide, and it's spread by aphids, but it's also the biggest threat could be on imported infected plant material or um, produce that's brought in. So it's very uh, important to, to be alert to this, this disease. Symptoms include mottling, spot, spotting and yellowing on the leaves, fruit and tree trunks. You get deformed blemish fruit, but once established in the, uh, in the orchard, you get fruit drop, and this is regarded as being an exotic disease to Australia. It's quite important and the uh, it, the governments and industries have come out with an awareness guide that's a, a foldable awareness guide that goes people um, working within the industry to be alert and to be aware. So this is a good educational perspective of how to get this um, alert, uh, be aware of this important um, problem. If it's seen, it needs to be reported. Another one that's very <clears throat> important for our wine industry is uh, Pierce's disease of grapevines. Uh, this is quite a severe disease, in, particularly in the American wine industry um, throughout California and places, and it's spread by uh, a sap or xylem-sucking insects. There's a couple of these insects, and so this is an, one of the cases, and there's many of these, where uh, there's a vector or an insect that's also responsible for transmitting some of these bacterial problems. Uh, this causes um, chlorosis and scorching of leaves and obviously photosynthesis um, reduction and um, yield loss. So this is one that we need to keep out of Australia for our wine industry. Hong Long Bing, or citrus greening, uh, is very important to our citrus industry. Actually, Hong Long Bing means yellow dragon sickness. It was first uh, identified in China and then later, lately, later it was spread through Europe and, and America. Uh, and it's also known as citrus greening. But these days it's pretty much known as HLB or Hong Long Bing. Um, it's caused by three strains of Candidatus Librobacter, and this one is the Asiatus, that is uh, an important one in the, in the tropical regions. Brand negative uh, bacterial pathogen of citrus trees. Again, it's transmitted by feeding psyllid insects, and uh, they pass the bacterium into the, into the phloem, uh, and you get symptoms including yellow, blotchy mottling of leaves, leaf drop and dieback, and um, you can see the 
chlorosis on some of these leaves. And this is exotic to Australia. Now, one of the interesting things about this um, particular disease is it's very difficult to control. Uh, there's so much work going on the, around the world to try to find an adequate control through resistance. But one of the it, it, one of the ways that has been had marginal success of controlling this disease is with the use of antibiotics. Um, and so, in my travels in Thailand, I've come across orchards where ampicillin is injected into the tree trunks uh, several times during the season to. I'd suggest suppress the symptoms of the disease, which enables um, the production of the fruit to go ahead. And you know, farmers' livelihoods depend on uh, being able to give some control. And so this uh, is one way that it's done, and, and this is using um, ampicillin that's sourced from India, uh, imported into this manufacturing pharmaceutical company in, in Thailand. They use, the farmers have got a, a very good, a way of connecting these old plastic uh, Coke bottles with brass fittings and then these um, connections and they're all uh, leading into the trunks and they're uh, uh, into the, dripped into the um, trunks to suppress the disease. The only problem with using an antibiotic like ampicillin is the uh, build-up of antibiotic resistance um, bacteria and there is a little bit of concern about the microbiome in um, people's intestines in their bodies from that use this practice to try to control Pong Long Bin. It's not a practice that I think uh, well, is sustainable, but anyway, that's just an, an interesting side effect, a side that, it, that if we get this into Australia, we really uh, have trouble controlling it. Another topical exotic disease is potato zebra chip. That has an interesting name because infected potato tubers, when deep fried or processed, they have these uh, zebra chips in the chip and they apparently are not a very good marketable um, outcome. But also this uh, strain of Candidatus librobacter uh, causes stunting of and chlorosis and stunting and reduction of, um, of production. So it's not a, a good one that we want to get here. Uh, it's also transmitted by the what's called the tomato potato psyllid. Uh, now this pathogen is on our doorstep. It's uh, in the New Zealand um, potato industry. And we've got two things to worry about here. We've got the psyllid, the vector, and also the actual strain of the um, bacteria. And just recently in 2017, the psyllid has popped up in Western Australia. And there's a national TTP um, group looking at surveillance across um, all our industries, tomatoes, uh, potato industries being on the alert for this. And it's felt that it's just a matter of when, not uh, when it's going to, when it, it's a matter of time or when it will get here. So this is uh, something that you can look at in trying to combat and control the, the vector, the psyllid, but once the bacterium gets in and causes these problems, then there has to be resistance breeding or some other mechanism to try to reduce the impact of this severe disease. And another um, one that's uh, I've seen quite a bit of in my time in Asia is citrus canker. And this is uh, caused by Xanthomonas um, subspecies citrii. And you, if you're in um, Thailand, for example, and you're having a nice iced uh, charmanal, which is the iced tea, and it's got lime in it, and they put in um, nice bits of uh, lime, or as you might do, you'd be on the... Uh, hotel bar and you're having a gin and tonic and they always put a nice half of a small little bit of lime in and that's a good place to see citrus canker. You'll see it as these rays, warts, warty bumps on the actual skin of the fruit. Uh, it's a cosmo cosmetic problem in that sense but it's also severe when it gets into the orchard. Uh, you get um, these white, uh, sorry, you get these lesions, these raised lesions with a halo effect and um that does cause a severe infection, of course, leaf and fruit drop. Now, this would be really a problem that gets into our citrus industry and it has been detected in Australia and uh, so far eradicated, I believe. So its recent detection was in 218 in Darwin and then it was picked up in northern Western Australia. Uh, so this is a, a high-risk pathogen that um, citrus industry is very much on top of trying to um, uh, prevent it from 
from getting here and spreading. So that's a few, I'd say, exotic pathogens um, that we would like to keep out and we need to have strong plant uh, biosecurity uh, and to prevent these things incur coming in and um, having a problem. So uh, just a couple of uh, examples of recent um, pathogen introductions and I'll put these up because you can see how they've come in, uh, they've established themselves and so it's not a matter of eradication, it's a matter of containment. One is Papaya ring spot virus. Uh, this is caused by a uh, potivirus uh, uh, plant, a uh, ring uh, PRSV T strain. It produces these really interesting carotic or necrotic rings on the leaves, fruit or stem, and eventually the malformation of the leaves, which is some shoe stringing and plant death. Uh, you see this quite common in um, Thailand. This is uh, these symptoms were in colleague's backyard. It's first detected in, it was first detected in South Queensland in 19, South East Queensland in 1991. And I, from what I understand, it's not yet found in Central or North Queensland, but I'm sure there's surveillance work going on for this as well. So it's something that we, we don't want to get in. It's actually was responsible for nearly wiping out the Hawaiian papaya industry, uh, I think in the 70s or 80s. And um, it, 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 it's something that there is control for this and it was with the Transgenic papaya, they're using coke protein gene. So there is some, some way of overcoming this. But there has to the transgenic papaya would need to be accepted by the uh, community. And myrtle rust, this is one that has recently been detected in Australia. It's uh, a really problematic uh, fungal rust pathogen. It was um, detected in New South Wales in April 2010. And it then by December 2011, it was found in Victorian production nurseries and wholesale outlets. Uh, and then 2015, it was found in northern Tasmania, and then also was detected on Melville Island in Northern Territory, and now it's recently been confirmed in New Zealand. So this is an example of how a, um, a fungal pathogen like rust has been able to come in and adapt to our very diverse climatic changes. So we talk a lot about the impact climate change might have on this disease or that disease, but in this case, the pathogen seems to have not worried about the diverse climates from the tropics to down in the temperate region. So it's quite a, an important um, one, a pathogen because um, it's, it causes a lot of uh, deformed leaves, defoliation, but it's also actually uh, problematic because it's severe on certain species of native plants and it's almost um, ch it's changing the biodiversity in some, some areas where it's got established. And it affects a wide range of the Mertesi. Um, so it's going to have a large impact on ecosystems and biodiversity, but it's something we have to live with now and try to deal with. Um, it's interesting that in, in around the Logan region in, in Queensland, just southeast Queensland, there was a, a new, a reasonably new, new species discovered of trees uh, named after the Premier Wayne Goss, called Gossier. And there's only about 73 trees exist, but they found out that it's very susceptible to this myrtle rust. So it's something that we want to protect and try to not um, get infected. And sugar cane smut. I spent a lot of time in the sugar industry in my early days and <clears throat> never came across uh, smut in those days. And it was always regarded as the number one enemy for the Australian sugar industry. But sure enough, it uh, eventually made its way into the sugar and cane industry in Australia. It was first reported in the Ord River in 1998. And then it popped up in Childers, just out of uh, uh, Bundaberg, west of Bundaberg in Queensland in 2006. And now it's established itself in all regions. It, it's not only is it spread by the smut spores, but it's also um, by vegetative material that's infected. And you get this quite dramatic black whip-like structure which is formed from the growing point in the top of the spindle of the sugar cane. So that's something that we've now got and we have to deal with. And, and this is being dealt with through predominantly through resistant varieties and clean um, plant material. So there's a lot of ways of cleaning up your plant material. So I make the point that um, it's Australia's responsibility to also not export, pat export um, pathogens 
and identification in of novel pathogens in Australian crops, it may actually um, affect our export of produce, especially to countries that also have equally serious biosecurity protocols. Uh, and so I just want to highlight a, a couple of examples of, of where this where flat biosecurity <clears throat> plays a role in reverse here of, of identification, surveillance identification, and regulating uh, what is exported um, out into other countries in our produce. First of all, uh, there's an interesting story around the fire blight of apples and pears. Now, this is caused by a winia amylivora, another bacterium uh, that you can see that once it gets into the growing tips, it kills the, uh, the growing leaves and the flowers and it looks like there's a, a, a fire being affected them, there's a blight. For many, for a long time, it's, it was not to believe, it was believed not to be in Australia. And, and that was a fair assumption. It's very important that it, we don't have it here. It will really affect our um, pear and apple industry. So there's a very, been a long-standing embargo on the importation of um, apples, particularly apples from New Zealand. and uh, it's quite a political situation because New Zealand's been wanting to uh, send apples uh, to Australia on um, a balance of trade issue. So what happened was there was a visiting, there was a plant pathology conference in Adelaide in 1997 and uh, a visiting plant pathologist <coughs> from New Zealand took a little holiday in Melbourne and then noticed that there was um, fire blight symptoms in Botaniaster in the Melbourne Botanic Gardens and subsequently identified back in New Zealand that, uh, that this was a, a Nuwinia amylivora and went on to make this public. And as a consequence, um, this caused a great furor, uh, not only in um, uh, by the people to try to work out and identify where it came from, is it there, how widespread it is. But then politically, it started to affect Australia's trade in apples and pears. Um, I think the, the outcome of it all was there was a lot of investigation. The state government spent a lot of money uh, on diagnostics and doing a lot of molecular identification offshore in Germany. And, you know, it was confirmed that there was an Erwinia amylivora, but it's never been detected again. The plants were put into quarantine and actually grown and, and visually observed, or observed for this for many months afterwards. Um, it's safe to say it's been eradicated, uh, particularly from the gardens, um, and it's never, never popped up again. So unusual, was it a different strain? Was it a different pathotype? Or what we wasn't quite sure on all that, but I, what is sure is that it cost the Australian palm fruit about $20 million in lost revenue because of this reporting. Um, about $2.2 million was spent in surveys, diagnostics, media management, um, $7 million on a loss of international interstate trade, so apples and pears were not then sent on to New South Wales and Queensland, and also about $10 million in the loss of international trade. Um, and so I think it, it delayed the export of Tasmanian, Tasmanian apples into some um, countries that were deemed to be free of Apple blight. Um, Japan then uh, stopped the export of South Australian and Victorian apples and pears into Japan because they claim <clears throat> that they don't have fire blight. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just a little bit after this, a plant pathologist in Japan um, noticed or reported that he had detected the Winia amylivora in Japan, which therefore had the implications of. Um, of, uh, of their not being a, a disease-free status. This poor guy was hounded by the media and by other interested parties and he ended up committing suicide. So this is a particular um, pathogen that's had a lot of political um, problems with it. And you know, these days, uh, through the world trade uh, courts, Australia does import um, apples into, us, into Australia from New Zealand, but there are very strong risk mitigation procedures put in place. And it's also a very low likelihood that 
the bacterium would be transmitted from an apple. So it would have to be from the elites or whatever that came in with these apples. So I remember I gave a, uh, a talk to the uh, Australia Country radio station for Australia Wide and about this at the time. And there was protests in um, Victoria and South Australia about the government uh, making the, allowing apples in, but it, it, it's all been under a balance of trade and, <clears throat> and with proper risk management. So I think that's the situation today. Now, Chile anthracnose is close to me. I've been working on this for a long time. And this is a real case of complex taxonomy. And I, by highlighting this story, it'll show the issues facing our quarantine officers, our biosecurity staff who have to make decisions on risk management. So <clears throat> this has always been reported to be caused by uh, a complex of Colotrophicum species, and, and these particular species that I've mentioned here have been reported globally. But the disease has never been properly evaluated in Australia. Um, and for that extent, probably not that well evaluated in Southeast Asia or Asia or other parts of the world. Um, but it is a major disease of Chile in Asia and, and South America. And then in 2012, a new pathogen was reported to add to the mix, uh, Colotrichum scovoliums was reported. Um, it was basically a renaming of one of the other pathogens where the taxonomy was uh, worked on. And I'll just explain a little bit how that all came about. But first of all, I'll just step back a bit and talk about the Colotrichum fungal pathogens per se. And um, these are very important group of um, pathogens that are in the top uh, num at the top level of, of pathogens that cause disease worldwide and infect such a broad range of plant species. Um, it, 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 it infects crops, orchards, post-harvest disease, and, and then can be seed transmitted. And it is a very important biosecurity risk to importers and producers. So uh, strawberries, avocados here, you'll see that in, in your kitchen if you have old fruit that's um, been lying around. Um, Colotrichum species also can exist in a wide range of hosts and environments, uh, leaves, fruit, as I've said before, but you know, you've got things like pyrethrum growing in Tasmania that has Tanacidiae uh, right through to chilies in the, in the tropics, um, and it's a very important citrus pathogen. So the problem with Colotrichum taxonomy is there are just, when you get into it and you're doing the classic descriptions, there's too few morphological characters to be able to differentiate all the different species. <clears throat> it's always been a problem. <clears throat> and so some of these characters that you actually have, and for example, colony morphology, it can be quite variable within a species and it's influenced by the environment conditions. So it's not a very good markers to be able to differentiate the different um, species that um, have been evolved. <clears throat> so these days, <clears throat> with modern molecular taxonomy, um, this is the way that a lot of these uh, species have now been delineated. So we have um, molecular taxonomy of fungal plant pathogens is based on the sequences of specific fungal genes. Um, I won't go into all that, but basically what happens is you have exons and introns and the coding region is fairly conserved within all genera um, and you can design your little primers on reverse and forward primers on the exons, they amplify up a lot of the, the non-coding um, region, the introns, and that's the area that's subject to evolutionary change. So that's where you'll get divergence and eventually it's an indicator of uh, how diverse or a new, new these different individuals can become. So the procedure for gene sequence analysis is quite straightforward. You grow your isolates, go out, do a lot of survey, a lot of collecting, grow your isolates, and extract the DNA, and then your PCR with your gene-specific primers, <coughs> um, uh, sequence the bands that are amplified, you send them off to sequencing, then you use bioinformatics. So you use online database searches of the sequence for, it, for getting some identification, uh, but then the true identification really comes with the phylogenetic analysis and the way uh, you can um, look at the similarities and dissimilarities of the sequences of the different isolates. So bioinformatics is basically where you sequence the PCR amplified product of each gene for each um, 
isolate. Then you compare, you can go into the uh, National um, Gene Bank, the, the um, International Gene Bank, and you can search for your sequence to, to get a comparison to what's already been deposited. And this is an enormous gene bank repository. And using blast searches, you can get a, an idea. But unfortunately, um, gene bank is only as good as what's been put in and labelled. And there's a lot of inaccuracies of naming uh, and um, even of some of the gene sequences themselves. So to be on the safe side, if you're trying to identify uh, down into the uh, species level, you use phylogenetics. And this is basically determining the relationship between species based on sequence similarity. So you actually line up all your sequences of your different isolates and you're looking for um, similarities or dissimilarities or the degree of that that's going on in those sequences. Uh, and this is an example, say, of a comparative sequence of a partial RDNA ITS. Um, and you can see we've got uh, five different sequences here representing five different isolates. It's just been made up, but there are lots of variations where there's some differences between the different isolates here. That's for example. So when when that's all been um, um, lined up, then you can look at look at a uh, genetic relate, relatedness software, which um, builds phylogenetic trees and it shows clustering or clading of the isolates in their group similarity, similar groupings. So for example, those would all be the same. These two are, are more distant, so they're more phylogenetically distant, and there's usually significant values here that show that. And then just to give that in its perspective, when we're looking at a couple of different um, early day, we're looking at different prolototricum. Uh, here, this is a, a based on two genes, so you combine your gene sequences together to give more uh, integrity to the results. All these isolates here, they all cluster into this significant clade, and so they're all similar. They're, these are truncatum. This group are all similar. And this group down here, which were labelled as acutatum, actually separated into three different clades. Um, three different clades that you can see here. So uh, further evident work on this showed that these were all different, there were different species being associated here. So on the basis of uh, this phylogenetic analysis and this way forward, a landmark paper was produced in 2012 by colleagues in um, the uh, Fungal Biodiversity Centre, and they reclassified the whole group of um, Colototricum species that were in databases, and they uh, looked at um, breaking them up into complexes as well as into individual species. And so this is very similar to a trend to a lot of fungal taxonomy, uh, particularly plant pathogen as well, where you get this, because of modern molecular taxonomy, you get this... Uh, huge increase in new species that have been described. So if you combine and you make a phylogenetic tree based on um, five fungal genes, for example, you'll, you'll get a nice uh, series of uh, clades and separations. But in 2012, there were reported 119 species in nine species complex. And you can see how over the years that's grown until currently there's well over 250 species in um, 14 complexes and there's, I know there's manuscripts in press or in, in being published that are actually going to increase that to all complexes. So how does a quarantine officer, how does a sermon in bi biosecurity un understand the risk that the, all these different species can have and how does that impact our, uh, our trade and, and export if in another country they say, but hang on, you've now got new species and that. So that's the sort of some of the issues that are dealt with in Fungal taxonomists start naming new species. Well, let's come back to the chili anthracnose. <clears throat> so, it, as as I explained earlier, this was a an important, a small but important industry in Australia, but very important in South in Asia and in in South America and other parts of um, the world in Spain, for example, where there's a lot of production in of um, of chili chili um, capsicanum. And in Australia, there were three species that were known. Well, from the work that we were looking at in this, by 2016, this increased to six species. So we discovered that in Australia, there were actually six species here. And in Asia, 
in general, there were four species were had been reported, and by 2019, this has increased to 26. Um, and and in, in publications, 12 new species were reported from China. So big exponential growth in the number of uh, species that was found. So by 2021, um, by, by 2021, globally, there's about 33 species known to be pathogens of capturing an animal or chili, which is uh, quite a worry. And this is just a summary of all that uh, to show all the different species. A lot of these are new species. Um, these ones in red are from uh, what now occur in Australia. Uh, a couple of new species that were discovered um, and named, <clears throat> and it's and there's a and there's also quite a variation in how severe these are in terms of their pathogenicity. And then here it is in its nuts and bolts. This is what you strip down a fungal pathogen to when you're doing a taxonomic description. And this one was collected by colleagues in um, DPI in Queensland up at Rusty's Market in Cairns. So it was a new one and not yet described. And so by looking at the, uh, the morphological characters and particularly the phylogenetics, uh, we then named it CanSense. So what does that all, all mean now? We have a new species in Australia. So being a pathologist, I think it's really important to understand the, um, how pathogenic or how virulent these <clears throat> um, all these species are because they're not all the same. So do we need to worry about some? Do we need to worry less about others? And so when you look at the pathogenicity of colophotrophine species from um, capsicum arnum or from Chile, we see that, um, that these are two different studies and so the scoring systems are, 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 are different. So, But that doesn't, the important thing is the relative ranking of these. <clears throat> and um, what we find is that these important um, uh, pathogens that were detected in Asia, Stoboli and, and this one, Jarbanens, from um, south of Bogor in Indonesia, happen to be very aggressive. So <clears throat> they're uh, important. Now, we don't have those in Australia. So there's already a, should be a, a, a risk factor, biosecurity factor here to prevent those coming into Australia. And conversely, can sense, and this new one, Australianum, which we've just recently described, and I'll show you that in a minute, have been um, found in Australia but not overseas. So they haven't been detected in any other countries. Although I've got to say Australianum has popped up in some obscure plant in China. And so the important thing here is that now we've got these new, quite severe pathogens, um, not in Australia and in Australia, so we need to be careful of our, our borders and our import and exports. The other worrying thing is that, okay, so we've got what's in the name, there's lots of species, but okay, we have some ones we know more um, aggressive. But now another factor is cross-host pathogenicity, and that's a worry because um, one of these that occurs um, in Asia and in Australia, uh, Siamens, as well as our new ones, Kent Sense and Australianum, have also been shown to um, infect um, avocados and citrus. So well, Scovoli in particular, that's very widespread throughout the world, but not in Australia. Uh, it can infect avocados. So <clears throat> these work has been done in quarantine laboratories in our biosecurity complex where we can import these exotic pathogens and we can test their degree of, um, of pathogenicity. And so... That's another factor that has to be brought in when um, looking at the risk of trade of produce and what pathogens we might have. We, we certainly don't want scovoli coming in and then infecting our fruit trees uh, as well as our chilies. So just to sum up some of that, the impact on import and export of, of chili fruit, uh, we've got two virulent species not found in Australia, but they are in Asia two virulent species found in Australia, but not in other countries, and in species can infect other plants. So what's required from out outcomes of some of this work is it definitely needs to be more surveillance, and surveillance on trees and fruit are required, on, on neighbouring trees and fruit, not just on the host that you think this is going to be a problem of. And then that leads into molecular diagnostic tools being developed, such as qPCR that can be used at the front line of uh, import where sample plant material can be actually um, tested by using specific um, 
probes for that particular pathogen. There's a lot more work needs to be developed in this area. And we also need to look at the uh, risk analysis of these pathogens on the export of fruit. And this leads to a situation where a, a grower, a large grower in Bundaberg, uh, was, had, had some requests for trade of chilies to New Zealand put on hold until they could mitigate the risk because of the new pathogens that were identified in Australia. I'm not saying they're not in New Zealand, it's just that no one's probably gone out and looked. So there needs to be more surveillance. Um, citrus anthracnose in Australia is also another interesting case uh, that worries, uh, should worry our, our exporters and importers. So citrus in anthracnose causes post-harvest fruit and canopy blight. It's common, you often see it on mandarins. Um, if you put it in, the, have mandarins in the kitchen and you leave them in your fruit bowl, there's often a little brown stain, a tear stain, which then develops into a lesion as the uh, pathogen colonizes and grows. Um, it used to be thought to be caused by just two um, major colotrotrichum species. But recently, there's been reports globally of um, 18 different colotrotrichum species infecting citrus. So it's a big headache for people who are going to set legislation on what can be imported and exported. Um, so work was undertaken to look at um, citrus um, fruit and leaves and twigs from plants uh, from um, throughout parts of Australia and um, also from uh, culture collections. So in this particular phylogenetic analysis, uh, there was a lot of interesting uh, species came to the fore. So Siamence, a new species, was found in Mandarin in origin. Now, this is this Australianum, which has been identified. Now, the, the interesting thing here is that one of those isolates came from, um, I think, Hamilton, Victoria, and the other isolate came from way up in Queensland. So that's quite a large geographical range, and here we have the same identical um, ice pathogen being causing um, anthracnose in these citrus. So that's why we named it Australianum, because it occurs Australia-wide. Um, then we had Fructicola, the gliosporoides and that. So there was quite a, a surprise with the few isolates that were screened that <clears throat> there, there's um, quite a number of species being identified. Um, Australianum's new. It's the first report of uh, Fragaria from citrus and the first report of Simons and Fructicola from citrus in Australia. So I was working in biosecurity, looking at um, our export of, of um, citrus fruits overseas how worried would I be trying to work out uh, what what is the cause? Do we have these pathogens? Are they going to be sent overseas? The fruit is clean. And what do we import? Because this is only uh, five out of 18 species that have been reported globally. Of course, the pathogenicity is important because they may not be important pathogens. They might just be um, weak, uh, less aggressive pathogens. But we do know that um, because citrus is made up of different um, species, you have your orange and mandarin, they are different species. It might, there is often some adaptability across the different species, the host. And here we have that all these species up here, they could infect mandarin, oranges and lime and etc. One was more predominant mandarin, orange, lime. So these can be done with an in vitro testing or um, done with seedlings and glasshouses. The second phase of this study is to look at international or what's, what's in um, on our doorstep in, in Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines. It's sort of a, a more wider spread uh, study that needs to be conducted. And unfortunately, the PhD student working on this project has been stuck in China since January last year um, because of COVID. So it's her project that she's working on. So what's the impact on export and um, import of citrus fruit? Well, we've now got a new pathogenic species in Australia. Uh, we have cross-host infection. We know Australianum is also a pathogen of chili. So we need more surveys. We need more surveys and surveillance of trees and fruits required in both Australia and Asia. Um, we need to have more diagnostic tools, uh, such as qPCR. We also find that there's... Within the one species, there's also uh, a range of aggressiveness. So you can get 
um, even pathotypes developing. And so that's another layer of, of uh, concern for importing particular aggressive um, pathotypes or whatever into, of, of the pathogen. Um, and there needs to be a risk analysis of these pathogens on imports and export of fruit. Now, I'll finish up with this uh, slide that I found in an up-end supermarket in Bangkok. Australian mandarins um, rather severely infected with um, anthracnose. So is this a good look? Um, is the citrus industry doing the right thing exporting these, uh, this material? Now, since um, this paper went to, was published, there's been um, quite a lot of concern in the Western Australian citrus industry. We've had uh, reports that there's, they, they believe there's severe anthracnose occurring right throughout the citrus industry. So isolates will be looked at and identified uh, to see what species they are and how, how in, um, risk that is, what sort of risk that is. So this is the important issues of developing the research and identifying and surveillance. So, Okay, so in conclusion, the protection of Australia's uh, borders from incursion of exotic um, plant pathogens uh, requires investment and it requires investment in surveillance and development of diagnostic techniques. Uh, it needs to assess of the biosecurity risk, which is uh, the, the, not just the species, but the pathogenicity of the species. So are there pathotypes, are there aggressive isolates we need to keep out? Uh, the host range, the pathogens, well, 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 are they able to infect um, other fruit trees, vegetable trees? Um, and also their effect on um, native plant pathogens as well. So the, we have another project where we're looking at, um, we found Colototric pyrus, which is a, a, known to be a Colototric anthracnose of pears that reported first in New Zealand. We've now identified that to be a common pathogen of a number of Australian uh, native trees, and it's the same pathogen, but we don't know anything about its pathogenicity. So the next new project will be looking at the colototricums that are occurring in native vegetation, bordering our cropping and systems to see whether there's uh, the, the source of a lot of these um, uh, pathogens would be coming in from native forests if there's co-hosting. So that's an interesting um, uh, development that's come from this work as well. We also need to train more plant pathologists in taxonomy and diagnostics, and that's both at the undergrads and postgrads, so that they, there's a better awareness of um, diagnostics and surveillance. I have to say that every lemon tree that have, we've looked at in Melbourne from uh, right across the suburbs of Melbourne, we've isolated Colotogic and Gliasporoides from. Now, it's in all the lemon trees. And so if you have a lemon tree at home and, and have a look and see if the leaves have got a brown lesion with little black um, spots on it, they're the uh, cervulite, <clears throat> then you can see and bring it in and we'll, we'll try and isolate from it. But all around the campus systems garden, we've got citrus, it's all got uh, Colotogic in it. So it is everywhere. It's a question of how severe it is. Okay, and we also need close collaboration between Australian state governments, agricultural industries and universities that can do the research uh, and, the, and the surveying. So I'll just finish up there and I'd like to acknowledge that um, I've been in this business uh, quite a few years and I have to give a lot of credit to all the postgraduate students that have undertaken projects in, um, not just in biosecurity type projects or taxonomy, but a whole range of plant pathology areas. So it's the postgraduate students who are the driver of, of this fine research. So to all those postgrads, I know a lot of them are out there watch, watch, looking at this today, so um, well done. I'd also like to acknowledge all my colleagues at overseas institutes where um, I've spent a lot of time sampling, surveying, uh, working with students in those universities as well and doing some of the research. So it's been a very in, um, rewarding uh, exercise working with colleagues and going out and seeing what's around the, uh, the, the orchards and the farms in those areas. Uh, to the or colleagues in, in the faculty and also in the Faculty of Science, because I've had a, quite a bit of collaboration with um, collaborators over in um, science, as well as in the faculty. Uh, colleagues at AgVic, where there's a lot of things happening with, this, with our, our state government, 
and industry funding, and the industry partners who fund a lot of the research that is done. Okay, so I think I'll finish up there. Thank you very much. Paul, um, thank you so much for that. And um, maybe for now we can stop screen sharing. Um, we pro probably won't go back to the slides. And can I just remind everybody to put questions in the Q&A? There are a few there already, but there's also some that went into the chat and um, hopefully they've been rewritten in the Q&A. Um, there are a few questions in there, but Paul, I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative and maybe ask you a first question while people think um, of their questions and put them in the Q&A. Um, as, a, as an animal and human virologist, um, it, it strikes me that the first thing we would do, if we could, um, as in COVID at the moment, is, is, to, is to vaccinate if we had a problem. Can you vaccinate a tree or a plant? I mean, we, we understand plant immunology more now, and certainly against viruses, I, I understand how their immune system works, and it spreads throughout the whole plant. So it ought to be possible to give them something that immunizes them, shouldn't it? I, I, I think you're looking at here, it's something like systemic fungicides. So you, you put fungicides in and they're translocated throughout the plant and they get to the, to the leaves and the roots. And that's in a, in a chemical protectant uh, sense. But in, in triggering plant immune systems, there are um, some areas of research where trying to uh, stimulate the genes that would um, switch on resistance mechanisms. Um, and there's this a little bit of cross immunity work being done with some vir vir viral diseases, and that's probably where it is. There's, um, it's, it's not commercially sound. Uh, and then, of course, using chemicals such as antibiotics is shown to have some effect. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking maybe putting in some virus sequence and inducing RNAi so that you then had a protective response against the virus mm -hmm. when it turned up, be it plum pox virus or papaya ring spot virus or something, or tomato spotted wilt or whatever it might be. Well, the code protein of, of that papaya ring spot virus is shown to develop, right. uh, uh, produce a resistance in papaya. Mm. Through that, it's a similar, it, it affects the machinery of the reproduction of the virus in the plant. Okay, um, let's go to the Q&As that other people have got and I'll invite them to ask their question. And I've got a couple from uh, Yupei Tan. Yupei Tan, would you like to ask a couple of your questions? You've written down four there, so maybe you could choose two of them and uh, ask Paul two questions. We might come back to you, but for now, two questions. Oh, I thought you were going to read it out. Hi, Paul. It's a great honor to see you, to, um, to watch your um, seminar. Um, okay, so uh, I'll pick two of the questions. Uh, one is uh, that you showed that there was a, like um, our federal biosecurity and our state biosecurity agencies have a list of pathogens that they're really on the lookout for, that stakeholders are aware of, such as Xylella and HLB. But what about those that... Um, aren't in the radar, so to speak, that stakeholders aren't quite aware of, but then when they've been discovered or established, um, have quite an impact. And with this, I'm thinking of, um, you know, CGMMV on cucurbits and um, PSA in um, kiwi fruit. Mm. I, um, I, one, one thing is certain in this world is that we know that there's a lot we don't know. <laughs> um, those list of pathogens I put up, those exotics, were just... Off the top of my head, they were not a list that that's, is uh, on a, a state or a federal regulation. Um, there are a lot there that um, um, are there to be uh, alert people to. So, yes, there is a lot of things, other things there. there you know, it's so much to, to understand and that, and especially of things that are um, little research has been done into, but we do know that they are, are a problem. But um, at the I just picked a couple off the top of my head to because they interest me, I guess. Yeah, so the federal government does actually have a list. You know, we always talk about the the top one hundred and forty four, and of the top one hundred and forty four, there's the top uh, twenty or the top forty. So it's um, from a state agency, I guess. The emphasis has always been on that. But then when something like CGMB and PSA comes up, it's always been um, a bit of a scramble. Um, okay, so my second question is, um, there is a school of thought with regards to, I guess, uh, plant biosecurity in terms of uh, either risk-based 
um, you know, uh, surveillance or um, analysis is rather than being based on the list of names. And as you've shown, you know, mm. names can um, can grow or I guess it's just um, discovery and um, reclassification. So rather than being based on names, what about being based on genes that are associated with or responsible for pathogenicity? What are your thoughts on that? Yes, it's a, a good the research uh, was there to be able to get to the bottom of that, of what is what are the pathogenicity genes that are responsible. And this is the area of work around Fusarium oxysporin. Um, there's people uh, been sequencing and looking at the xylem um, genes, secreted in the xylem genes of, of Fusarium oxysporin, which are associated with former specialis, very specific pathogen groupings. Um, that's a lot of there's a, there's yet to be a lot of uh, correlation that they can um, you can find these pathogenicity genes related associated with particular pathogens. There, there's this in its broad sense of causing disease. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area, and I think that with the future for whole genome sequencing, it gives us much more information and scope to be able to look at uh, um, virulence genes, look at these and see if they are, we can nail down to the specific gene that maybe this is a specific response if it's a, in more of a gene for gene relationship. So, yes, that's the way for the future, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you so much. It's good to see you again, Paul. And I can't believe you're retired. Thanks, you, Pay. Oh, I'm on a transition to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thanks, you, Pay. Um, next question from Liam Carlin Incol. Uh, Liam, do you want to ask your question? Or if not, I can. Uh, Liam, are you there? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Uh, Go for it. Uh, hi, John. Hi, Paul. Uh, I'd like to ask, could releasing genetically modified vectors of a particular disease that are resistant to that disease reduce the incidence of an incursion considering resistant vectors copulating with wild vector populations? Uh, okay, if I, I think if I got that right, you're talking about uh, modifying the vector so that it either doesn't feed or it doesn't um, uh, transmit the virus or it's not going to be able to accumulate it and, and the virus be persistent in it. But I, I think that's a very important way. And I think that with the psyllids that we have, these uh, burgeoning diseases of bacterial diseases caused by psyllids is something we can target the vector rather than necessarily trying to develop resistance, which is difficult. Um, John, our, our dean, I think it's part of his area that that he's worked with this in mosquito, in animal-borne uh, diseases. But, yeah, I think it's an area that the plant side always picks up after developments within the, the animals, um, the human sort of science, and we can adapt those things. Um, just to make a comment, um, in, in a mosquito transmitted disease, so if it would be something like yellow fever or dengue or chikungunya or something like that, the, the virus actually replicates inside the mosquito. So you could genetically modify the mosquito to uh, actually stop that virus replicating. But with a lot of these plant pathogens, as I understand it, it's a bit of tra um, mechanical transmission, is it not, Paul? So it's getting on, for example, aphid mouth parts and not necessarily having to complete some kind of life cycle inside the aphid and then it's physically transmitted to the next plant. Uh, I may have got that wrong, may not be always the case, but um, so I think it's a little bit different. So virus, I, yeah, with virus ahead. transmission, it's either in a persistent or non-persistent manner. So there is an, um, a, a, a manner, it's not just on the mouth parts, it's some of these plant viruses get in and they multiply and they work within the gut. And that's okay. always been seen as a, a mechanism <clears throat> for allowing transmission over time um, to, to be able to spread the virus. But if there was a mechanism that could be, a GMO mechanism that could be a target at that area, that would also be useful. Yeah. Um, Liam, thanks for that question. That's made us think and that there are some potential um, uses there, I think. Kate Howell. Um, Kate, do you want to ask your question? Thank you, John. Yeah, I was really interested in your taxonomy and the link between pathogenicity or, or the different um, isolates are more likely to be um, more uh, have a, like a different response in different species of citrus, and I wondered if you could talk about that um, with that particular fungal species. 
um, talking about uh, levels of aggressiveness. Um, yeah, what, what is it about um, yeah. uh, the pathogen or the plant that um, results in such a big difference in the pathogenicity? <clears throat> yeah, a good question. So what we have two things here. We have um, different species of the one genus which, all, which cause similar disease, but within between species there's quite a, um, an array of levels of uh, virulence or aggressiveness. But then you also have within the population of one species, we find that when you a- analyse many individuals in the one population of a species, you get a bell curve. You get a range of um, from highly aggressive to not so aggressive. And then, of course, in some cases where it's particularly in the colototric and when you're looking at uh, genotypes of the host and differentials, you can actually get true pathotypes where you get some isolates of a species infecting um, that genotype, but others that don't. Now, that's very genetic determined. And in crops where a lot of genetics has been understood, there is a bit more of the single gene, um, gene for gene relationship that allows or explains some of this the change in, in the virulence and in the resistance. So in the anthracnose in citrus, what we're looking at the, at the base level there is how different species of the pathogen uh, react on the different species of the citrus. And yes, it's partly to do with the genes of the, of the host, but it's also partly to do with the virulence factors in the pathogen. It's an area of uh, interest. Thanks for the question, Kate. Thanks, Paul, for the answer. Uh, I'm going to go to Mark Angelo Balendres, who's um, from the Philippines, and see if, uh, Mark, you can ask your question from there. Otherwise, I'll ask it. Um, are you there, Mark? Can you ask your question? Yep, just on mute, and you should be. Right, thanks very much, John. Thanks, Paul. That's very informative. Um, yeah, my question is all about naming and renaming this uh, new species or re- renamed species. Do you think that if we, re- if we name them based on where they were isolated, could have an impact on the way we perceive isolates and regions? Um, a, a good example is if it was first um, isolated from Queensland and it just happened to be found also in, let's just say for the sake of argument, in the Philippines. But in reality, um, it was really first from the Philippines. So um, people would thought that, ooh, someone has brought this from Queensland to the Philippines. So should we just name them based on host or discoverer, like um, De Lorenze for Taylor, so rather than Queenslandicum? What's your thoughts on that? Thanks, Mark. Um... The whole convention of, of taxonomy, it, it, the fungal taxonomy is driven by rules and conventions. And um, it has to be, to name a new species, it needs to be a certain protocol. And when you get to the choice of the name, uh, it can either be on a, a context like a person, uh, named after a person, or usually the location where it's first found. And um, that naming of things Queenslandicum, Australianum or, or, or Javanensis we've got there indicates <coughs> um, people have named them after where they've isolated. And I agree that that can uh, conceptually uh, cause problems with um, origin as well. But it's, it, what, if you name them on the, um, of, after some other convention, then, then it has to be standardised. It can be done throughout. So at the moment, it's... It's, we follow uh, uh, the rules of, of the convention and probably should move away a little bit from geographical place names, but to something like um, uh, named after people or a person of esteem or some, some other category, which you can as long as it's Latinized. So I agree with you that, yeah, maybe we need to look more at that as well. Yes, um, I, I draw the, from the experience we have here because... Um, some areas, like if I'm a mayor of a particular area for tourist attraction, mm-hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't like uh, a particular uh, agent that causes a destructive disease on a, a, a crop that is um, exported outside that name after a particular disease. So I'd I'd, I'd rather be asked if it's okay to name this based on the town that I'm uh, being mayor of. So 
um, yeah, it's it's good to know what you think of it, and I hopefully that it it would go outside of the box, like thinking that it should be named after a particular place because it it really might have a, an impact. But thanks for that. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, good, John. Good, good talk. Thank you, Mark. Um, certainly in um, animal and uh, human pathogens, if you name something after a place, it, it has had big repercussions. And there was a disease called Schmallenberg, which was a uh, caused abortion in sheep. And it was a pretty little town in Europe. And the mayor of that town complained vehemently about the fact that the this disease that caused abortions in sheep was named after his town. There was another one in um, the Four Corners area of uh, the United States, which is a big tourist area. And um, a lot of people died of a respiratory disease there. And it was called Four Corners virus. And um, in the end, they had to rename it. And they called it Sinombre, because that means in Spanish, no name. Um, so that was the story of Sinombre virus. So I think it's a, a, a good point. Um, Miguel Wood, we'll go to you. Um, Miguel, can you? Um, uh, yeah, you're there and go for your question, perhaps. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my my question um, is concerning the rate of change for pathogens. And in Latin America, we've seen the coffee rust pathogen to increase exponentially due to climate changes. I'm just interested in what's the potential heuristic here um, that may apply to all pathogens going forward? Yes, it, it, always, it interests me uh, the effect that climate change will have on on the um, more the severity of, that a disease will become, so mm. the pathogen is changing within within that um, population, and some re research that's been done on individual pathogens uh, have shown that you get both a negative and a positive effect. So this increased temperature, carbon dioxide, um, and then you go to the microclimate within the canopy and how that might change with climate change is conducive to making some pathogens more to mutate and to evolve into more severe uh, forms mm. and on the same sense it makes the environment un unsuitable for some pathogens to exist and to develop so there's each one has to be taken on its individual merit um, and so changes in climate certainly uh, uh, and pathogens can adapt and if the pathogen is uh, a sexually reproducing pathogen it's going to have a greater sensitivity to mutate and to change and to adapt. So adaptability within a population sense uh, will occur. So a lot of our, our fungal pathogens um, don't have a known sexual stage and they're still able to reproduce and mutate through other systems. But it's those that are sexually reproducing are more prone to be able to adapt to changes in the environment. Um, and so the rust, rust, coffee rust is quite severe and um, it. It, it obviously uh, has a, a greater ability to adapt and to change to overcome adverse environmental conditions. Thank you. Miguel, thanks for that question. Paul, thanks for the answer. Uh, in the interest of time, just going to fit in two last quick questions. I'm going to read them. And Paul, maybe you'll give us a quick answer. Um, the first is from Peter Taylor, maybe, maybe a relative here. Um, don't know. Um, and it's uh, the question is, Paul, um, it, is, infect, uh, is infected fruits such as mandarins, are these infected fruit toxic for humans or are they uh, okay to eat? A quick answer to that would be that if they're severely infected, I wouldn't eat them because they would be likely to have mycotoxins which um, come out. And, and particularly if it's in the penicillins, the fusariums, and even some of the coloptrigum, there are specific toxins that are not good for you. Um, in a lot of cases, if there's a small um, lesion, you can get rid of it and hopefully the rest of the fruit is okay, but not good to be eating too severely infected fruit with fungi, that's for sure. And the last one's um, from an anonymous uh, person and is also very practical. Um, so to prevent the spread of these pathogens, can we use any kind of decontamination method when we're, when we're exporting our fruit? I mean, we spray them with copper sulfate or something, or what, what, what can we do? Yes, yeah, so there's lots of um, processes in the food chain where uh, produce is is, um, is treated. I, I, I can relate to the citrus industry where <clears throat> fresh fruit is put through a series of uh, sodium bicarbonate and then fungicides to get rid of any surface pathogens. Uh, treating um, some products with benzalkanium chloride, just base sterilants is also a way. But there's, they don't have to use chemicals. There's, there's lots of uh, issues around controlled environment 
and, and packaging that's used these days that um, allows gas exchange. A lot of these things prevent or delay the onset of some of these uh, important latent infections in fruit and, and, and in vegetables. So um, there are methods and there are methods employed that <clears throat> um, help prevent uh, that. Now, in terms of decontamination of a latent infection for export, for example, strawberries, there was a technology around ionisation. So they used to use an ionisation process to kill those late infection of strawberries, but that had a um, poor consumer acceptance and there was some off taste reported. So it's not readily done today in fruit. Okay. Well, Paul, I think um, we'll draw it to a conclusion there. Uh, thank you so much for a really informative seminar. I've certainly enjoyed it and uh, learned a lot and I hope everybody else has as well. Um, thanks to everyone who joined our seminar series today, and I hope you'll be able to join us on the 11th of May to hear next month's seminar from Professor Mark Stevenson in Melbourne Veterinary School, and he's going to talk on unravelling population health problems in honeybees, koalas, domestic animals, and humans. Until then, thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you.